This is Indianapolis coach, Retro Wayne, and you're listening to the For the Culture podcast. This is the For the Culture podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. Monday Night Football as the Colts go on the road tonight to take on the New Orleans Saints in the Superdome primetime game as the Saints come in at 10-3. and So this will be arguably the hardest game on the Colts' schedule this season. It's a must-win game because, guys, believe it or not, we're like the cockroaches of the AFC. Somehow, the Colts are mathematically still alive both in the wild card and the AFC South. So you take a look at the playoff picture after yesterday's slate of games. The Colts could still win the AFC South if we win out. So we have to beat the Saints tonight on the road. We have to beat the Panthers next week at home. And then we have to go on the road and beat the Jags in Week 17. The Texans need to lose on the road against the Bucks next week. And the Titans need to lose at home against the Saints and then in week 17, we would need the Titans to beat the Texans on the road in Houston. If all those things happen, all three teams finish at 9-7, and seven, and the Colts actually win the three-way tiebreaker. We split head-to-head with both teams, so all three teams will have the head-to-heads canceled out. They each beat each other once. We beat the Titans once. We beat the Texans once. They each beat us once. So the three-way tiebreaker would be split across the board head-to-head. Then it goes to AFC South record. The Titans are therefore out because the Titans already have lost three games in the AFC South. They lost to the Jaguars earlier this season. And then the Colts and Texans split head-to-head, both 4-2 and two in the AFC South. This would be their second AFC South loss. They already lost to us earlier in the season. And then it goes to common opponent, and they won their AFC East game. We lost our AFC East game. We both lost our AFC North games. So then when it comes down to common opponent, we would have a one-game advantage in games where we've played common opponents. And then that would actually give the Colts the edge before we get to AFC South record, which we would have lost. So... We could win the three-way tiebreaker if those things were to happen. And then when you look at the wild card picture, pretty straightforward. The Colts need to win out. The Steelers need to lose out. The Titans need to lose out. The Steelers have at Jets next week, at Ravens week 17. And although the Ravens might not be playing for anything, if we know John Harbaugh, he'll be playing to win that game. Especially you have the next week off. You don't really want to stop this momentum. They're on a 10-game winning streak. After next week, they'll probably be on an 11-game winning streak. You want that momentum going in to the divisional round of the playoffs. You're going to have a week off regardless for rest. So do you really want to rest two weeks in a row? We've seen teams do that in the past and then come out slow and sluggish, especially a team as hot as this Ravens team is right now. Plus, you get to keep your arch rival out of the playoffs, which is always fun. So I think we could see Lamar Jackson and the starters play a majority of that game and win that game against the Steelers. I think next week will be a tougher game for the Colts, needing the Jets to help us out and beat the Steelers. But the Steelers have been a better team at home than on the road this year, and both of their final two games are on the road. And then we would need the Titans to lose out at home against the Saints next week and on the road against the Texans in Week 17. But none of this matters. Nothing the Steelers do, the Texans do, the Titans do. None of it matters if the Colts can't win tonight. And it's going to be an uphill battle. Because we're going on the road playing one of the best teams in the league. Good on both sides of the ball. Well coached by Sean Payne, one of the best offensive minds in the NFL. Future Hall of Fame quarterback in Drew Brees, who could pass Peyton Manning in touchdown passes tonight against the Colts. Peyton Manning, 539 career touchdown passes. Tom Brady in second place with 538. And Drew Brees in third place with 537. So Brady and Breeze could go back and forth. As long as the two of them are playing and playing at the same time, they could reclaim the most touchdown passes in NFL history on a weekly basis. Breeze could break it tonight. Brady could break it next week. Breeze could break it an hour after that. They could go back and forth. That's really going to come down to who wants to retire first. If one of them outplays the other one for a full season, they will have the comfortable lead in touchdown passes all time. So Peyton Manning holding on by a thread, one touchdown ahead of Brady, two touchdowns ahead of Breeze. If Breeze has three touchdown passes tonight, he will pass the Sheriff for most touchdown passes in NFL history as those three are bunched up at the top on the all-time touchdown pass list. So it won't be an easy game. It's actually the toughest game on our schedule. And not only are we playing a really good 10-3 and Saints team, not only are we playing them at the Superdome, not only are we playing them on Monday Night Football, but we're playing them 
one week removed from a 48-46 loss. They put up 46 points last week and lost. You have three 11-3 teams. They're looking to be the fourth 11-3 team in the NFC. So this is going to be an uphill battle for the Colts. We are mathematically still alive. But all that ends tonight with a loss. So the Colts need to win tonight to stay alive. And it's going to be a tough task going on the road, taking on the New Orleans Saints in the Superdome on Monday night. Yeah, no question. This is a tough game for the Colts. In my opinion, probably the toughest of the year. The Saints are definitely a a really, really good team. I would not be surprised to see them in Miami at the end of the year. They're coming off a tough loss, so they're going to be primed and ready to play this game. It's a Monday night game. Everybody's going to be watching. Not a good matchup for the Colts, obviously, with all the injuries. But not just that, the Saints are really good against the run. They are elite offensively. They have an elite quarterback. It's just not a good matchup in any way, shape, or form. So it's going to be a tough night for the Colts. I don't think they're going to lay down or or give up or anything like that. I just think this is probably the one game this year where they're just completely outmatched and outclassed. And uh, that sucks, but, you know, that's where we're at right now. So, you know, they go out there, play as hard as they can. Hopefully, you know, you never know what can happen. But as far as just looking at it, pre-game. It doesn't look good for the Colts. Nope, but we were just talking about it off air. You were saying that the only way you win this game is to run that Kansas City model from earlier in the year where you run the ball and you keep the quarterback on the sideline. In that game, it was Patrick Mahomes. In this game, it's Drew Brees. And we went into both these games kind of feeling the same way. Really difficult uphill battles, going on the road, playing really good teams on prime time, great quarterbacks, great coaches. And we were going into both games coming off losses where we played really bad against the pass. Carr cut us up before the Chief game, and Jameis Winston just threw for 450 yards and four touchdown passes against us in a loss last week against the Bucks. So now we're going up against these great elite quarterbacks coming off poor performances to more middle-of-the-pack guys, and you feel like you have no chance to stop the pass. But in the Chief game, we stopped the pass essentially by running the ball down their throat and keeping Patrick Mahomes on the sideline. The problem is, in this game, the Saints are top five in the NFL against the run. The Chiefs were bottom five at the time in the NFL against the run, and I think they're still in that same ballpark. So that could be the difference in this game, it being difficult for us to run the ball against that stout front seven. Yeah, they're really good against the run, and that's regardless of that, that is still the only way the Colts have a chance in this game is to keep the offense off the field and to basically take all the time off the clock and win the time of possession. Whether it's checkdowns or runs, that's the only way they can win this game because once that offense gets on the field, they're going to score points, they're going to score fast, so Yeah, this is definitely not a good matchup for us. Nope, but let's start off on the offensive side of the football for the New Orleans Saints. They average 26.5 points per game, which is fifth in the NFL, and they're 11th on third down conversions, converting successfully 42.5% of the time. And of course, the New Orleans Saints offense led by future Hall of Fame quarterback Drew Brees with 2,140 passing yards, 17 touchdowns to four interceptions. Drew Brees... Missed some time this season. They really didn't skip a beat with Teddy Bridgewater. Undefeated in games Teddy Bridgewater started. They did lose the game where Breeze left the game and Bridgewater came in to relieve him. But then they went undefeated with Bridgewater as a starter. They've dropped two games since Breeze returned to the lineup. But Drew Brees, great quarterback, will be in Cannes, Ohio one day. And like we said earlier, he could become the all-time leader in touchdown passes in this game. He's just three away from the record, which will probably be broken again next week by Brady and then back to Breeze and back to Brady, and they'll play volleyball with that record for as long as they want to play at the same time in the NFL. Great dual threat running back in Alvin Kamara. He could do it all. He could catch the ball. He could run the ball on the ground. He has 138 carries for 612 yards, averaging 4.4 yards per carry and a touchdown in the air, 68 receptions for 462 yards. And a touchdown. It's only two touchdowns on the year for Alvin Kamara. One in the air, one on the ground. But still so versatile, so dangerous, so explosive. Once he gets the ball in his hands, he can make really good things happen. Wide receiver Michael Thomas, arguably the best wide receiver in the league. And statistically hard to argue against it in 2019. With 121 receptions for 1,424 yards. Averaging 11.8 yards per catch and 7 touchdown passes. You look at the reception number, 121, with three games remaining, only 22 receptions behind Marvin Harrison's all-time single-season reception record. So that record is in jeopardy of being tied or broken 
by Michael Thomas this season. He needs to average a little over seven receptions per game over his final three games to tie or break that record, a record that I thought might never be broken, could be broken this season by Michael Thomas having an incredible season. And if our secondary is as bad as they were last week against the Bucks, he might break it in this game. 22 receptions behind Marvin Harrison's all-time record from 2002. I really don't want to see him break that record, but over the next three games, the record is without a doubt in jeopardy because Michael Thomas is on quite the streak in 2019 and has a great quarterback thrown to him to try to break that record. Tight end Jared Cook, 34 receptions for 523 yards and six touchdowns. And the wild card factor in their offense, a guy you might not be thinking about, but a guy that could definitely beat you. Running back Latavius Murray, 113 carries for 533 yards and five touchdowns. And in the air, 29 receptions for 190 yards and a touchdown. A very versatile, high-powered offense, as you'd expect from the New Orleans Saints when you have an offensive mind like Sean Payton and a quarterback like Drew Brees and a running back like Alvin Kamara and a wide receiver like Michael Thomas. They're loaded offensively. They could put up points in a hurry. They put up 46 points last week and came out on the losing end. They're dangerous at home. They're dangerous on prime time. And they're dangerous coming off a loss. All three apply in this game against the Saints tonight on Monday Night Football. Yeah, the first thing you'll notice about this offense is how quickly Breeze gets the ball out. I think he averages getting it out in like two point something seconds, like 2.3 seconds or something like that. So they tend to get the ball out really, really quick. Kamara's huge in the passing game. They use him. Like I wish the Colts would use Mack in the passing game. He's got 68 receptions. So he's going to be a big time factor in this game. And then Michael Thomas, selfishly, I want the Colts to double cover him and hold him to his fuel amount of catches as possible because I want Marvin to keep that record of 143 catches and make other people beat us because, I mean, if you play him one-on-one, it's going to be a long, long game. Then you got Cook as far as the tight end goes. I'm not sure if he's 100% or if he's definitely going to play because I know he he got a concussion in the last game, so he's probably questionable. But if he does play, he's a big-time weapon in the middle of the field, and obviously Murray gives – Kamara, the ability to do different things. He can line Kamara up wide, play him in the slot. They can do a lot of different things. Peyton's really, really an offensive genius when it comes to getting guys in the right position and getting the most out of players. So this is definitely definitely going to be a tall task for our defense, especially coming off our worst defensive performance in probably two or three years. So definitely not the team you want to see after a bad defensive performance, nor do you want to see the Saints after they lose a close, close game to the 49ers. So, yeah, the Saints are going to be ready to play, and this is just going to be an uphill battle for us. Yep, and you mentioned the game the Colts are coming off, giving up over 500 yards of total offense, 450 passing yards to Jameis Winston. We gave up a ton of big plays in that game, and that's where we start with the keys to the game Monday night against the Saints. Number one, limit big plays. Yeah, you absolutely have to limit big plays against this team because if you don't, you're just going to get blown out. They will have one and two play drives. You've really got to make them go the long way. And even if they do score that way, at least that way, you're eating some of the clock. Maybe they make a mistake. The more plays you make them run, the more likely they make a mistake. And so that's that's key. I mean, I, this is a key for the, this defense for the rest of the year as far as I'm concerned because I've seen more big plays in the last two weeks than I've seen all year. So they really have to get it together this week and make the Saints go the long way and not give them one, two, three play drives for touchdowns. It just can't happen. They've got to be better this week. It's asking a lot, but these are professionals, and the Colts got to step up. Key number two, defensively, play aggressive. Yeah, I don't want to see any more zone, like not for 90% of the game. If we're going to get beat in this game, I want our corners up on the receivers, bump and run at the line of scrimmage, and just playing our game. We are at our best defensively when we're aggressive at the point of attack and also aggressive outside on the receivers. And, yes, I know Michael Thomas is a top three receiver, and he's definitely been the best receiver this year with his stats and whatnot. But I don't care. you got to play aggressive. Be who you are. I think the Colts are much better defensively when they attack and dictate the game as opposed to have the game dictated to them. And I feel like that's what the zone does. It allows the other team to dictate what they're going to do as opposed to when you're – you know, really aggressive and shutting them down, you're dictating things to them. So play aggressive is definitely huge in this game. We did not do it in the last game, even though we did get four turnovers. We were not aggressive in our zone at all. It was wide open spaces all game long for Winston. We cannot have that this week or they might score 50. 
Yep, and key number three, just like the first two keys, things we did not do last week, and we've been pretty good at this for the most part this season, but definitely not last week against the Bucks. Key number three, tackle. Absolutely got to tackle this week. That's going to be a key. Kamara's going to get out, you know, get out in the flat, and you're going to have to tackle him. You can't allow him to you know, make a move and get 25 yards. You've got to get out there, gang tackle that guy. Just make sure you get him on the ground. However, you can do it, just do it. That's what the Colts have to do. They've got to improve that from last week. They were terrible tackling last week, aside from Darius Leonard and a couple of other players. They've really got a gang tackle this week and, and bring bring some of that swagger back to their defense. They, they kind of lost it last week. They need to get it back this week, and hopefully they'll tackle better and do these three things that, that we're talking about. Because if they do those things, they've got a much, much better chance of being competitive in this game. If they don't, they have no chance. Yep, as we flip sides of the field now and take a look at the New Orleans Saints defense in this Week 15 matchup, they have a couple defensive linemen heading to the IR. Sheldon Rankins, defensive tackle, and Marcus Davenport, defensive end, both on the IR and obviously will not be playing in this Week 15 matchup. The Saints defense, much better than in years past, do a good job stopping the run, as we said earlier, allow 94.2 rushing yards per game, which is 5th in the NFL, and they allow 22.8 points per game, which is 17th in the NFL, and they get off the field a majority of the time on defense, 65% of the time they're off the field on third downs, allowing teams to convert successfully 35.5% of the time. So overall, one of the better Saints defenses over the past few years, coming off by far their worst performance of the year, allowing 48 points in a 48-46 loss to the San Francisco 49ers. But do you really want to play a defense coming off a performance like that? Because you figure they have to snap out of it. They can't be that bad two weeks in a row. They're not going to give up 96 points in two weeks. And you might need to score 40-plus to beat the Saints with this high-powered offense after the Colts' defense looked the way they looked last week against Jameis Winston and the Bucks. Because if you take away the turnovers in the Bucks game, the Colts probably give up 50 points in that game because we only forced two punts the entire afternoon against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And this Saints' defense is highlighted by linebacker Demario Davis, 95 tackles, three sacks, and a pick. Defensive end Cameron Jordan, 46 tackles, 13.5 sacks. One of the league leaders in sacks. I think he's second or third on the list. Free safety, Marcus Williams, 53 tackles, four picks, a forced fumble, and a defensive touchdown. And cornerback, Marshawn Lattimore, 51 tackles and a pick. Talented Saints defense, plus 11 as a team in turnover ratio. 11 more turnovers forced than given up offensively. And this is a Saints defense that is definitely looking for a bounce-back performance going up against a vulnerable Colts offense that relies heavily on the run game. Saints top five in the NFL stopping the run and have struggled to stretch the field vertically all season long. Absolutely, and the, and the thing about the Saints, they're, they're a very well-rounded team. Like I said earlier, I think they're the best team that we've played this year. I mean, when you take into consideration offense, defense, special teams, they're very stout up front against the run. It remains to be seen how the, the effects of losing Rankins and Davenport to the IR, how much that will affect them. But up to this point, they've been able to stop the run pretty well. I mean, fifth in the league, their front seven is good. Obviously highlighted by Cameron Jordan, who's a game wrecker, as Chuck would call him. He's got 13 and a half sacks, so we're going to have to do a good job on him. We did a decent job last week against Shaq Barrett. I think he did have one sack, but we did a pretty good job on him. Demario Davis is a very good linebacker. He's got 95 tackles and three sacks, as Luke mentioned. We saw him with Houston earlier in his career. And in free safety, Marcus Williams is a big-time player. A lot of people remember him as the guy in the Minneapolis Miracle that kind of blew up the play and screwed up or whatever. But he's actually – his career's turned around. He's an all-pro caliber free safety. He makes a lot of big plays. He might be their, their biggest playmaker on their defense. He's a, he's a special player, a kid I really like coming out of Utah. So they've got playmakers at every level of the defense. So, And you throw in Marshawn Lattimore's kind of had an off year, but for the most part in his career has been a shutdown corner. They've got some really good players on that defense. And you throw in the, the plus 11 turnover ratio. They pressure the quarterback a ton. I think they, they've got 42 sacks overall, and they've only allowed 20 sacks. So they force turnovers. They don't turn the ball over. They pressure quarterbacks. Breeze is at pressure too much. Part of that is the design of the offense, obviously, getting the ball out quick in that Sean Payton offense. But uh, defensively, man, they're, they're, uh, they're stout, and the Colts are really going to have to come to play. 
and do a good job with the fundamentals of the game, much better than they did last week. Yep, and taking a look at the three keys to the game for the Colts, offense matching up against the Saints defense. Key number one, no turnovers. I mean, I could say this every week, but we keep turning the ball over. So until we stop turning it over, I'm going to say no turnovers. And especially in a game like this, we have no more. There is no margin for error in this game. We cannot turn the ball over. This game won't even be close if we turn the ball over. So that's number one. We have to start with that. Do not turn the ball over if you want to be competitive in this game, which we do. So no putting it on the ground, no stupid throws. Just going to have to be fundamentally sound and make good decisions and not turn the ball over. Key number two, run the ball. Yeah, we've at least got to try to run the ball in this game. The only way for me seeing this game as even being competitive is if we're able to run the ball and keep that offense off the field. So running the ball and doing the things that we need to do it to stay ahead of the chains is really important. Eating clock is going to be important in this game because the longer that the offense has, that offense has on the field, the more points they're going to put up. And we, we really, I, I just don't want this to get ugly, honestly. So run the ball, try to mix up ways to get the ball to Mac. Anything and everything that we could possibly do to keep that offense off the field is what we've got to do, and that starts with running the ball. And key number three, get the tight ends and running backs involved in the passing game. Yeah, I would love for our offense to look at the way that New Orleans uses Camara and use Mac like that. For some reason, we take Mac off the field a lot of times on passing downs. I don't really understand that. We don't really target him that much in the, in the passing game, which I also don't understand. This would be a nice week to mix that up and to use our running backs out of the backfield and allow them not only to catch the ball, but to have room to run. Usually, Jacoby holds onto the ball so long and is it's only a last resort when he throws it to the running back and generally there's already a guy there ready to make the tackle it'd be nice if this week he threw the ball out of the you know got in a rhythm threw the ball of the guy out of the backfield right off the bat gave him some some time to do something in space because we he very rarely gets the ball to mac in space in the passing game it would be nice if he did that this week obviously then you look at a guy like jack doyle he gets open we need to look for jack get the ball to jack get the ball to mac the Jack and Mac. I mean, that sounds like a Chuck thing, but we just have to utilize those guys more. I don't think they've been used enough, especially Doyle and Mac. So that's something key that I'm looking in for the rest of the year, honestly, because I want to see these guys get utilized a little bit more than they have been. And uh, without Ebron out there and Mac getting healthy again, you should see these guys have more of, an, more of a statistical impact on the game so that's the third and final key to this game and as far as our predictions go Jason I'll go first I love the fact that we're playing for something in this game I really did not want to come into this game mathematically eliminated because it's a Monday night game it's prime time the entire country the whole world's watching you also don't want to get embarrassed in this game but it's just nice going into the game if we were to lose a close game to lose a close game where we're rooting for something we actually have a heartbeat we have life in this game, we're not going to roll over. I believe the Colts are going to come out. I think they're going to play hard. Even if we were mathematically eliminated, I still think the team would have come out and played hard just because that's the way these guys are wired. Like, if we lose this game, I think we still come out and play hard against the Panthers next week and against the Jags in Week 17 because I think that's just the makeup and the character of these guys, of these coaches. I think they're going to continue to fight regardless. I know fans out there are going to be rooting for draft picks, but I think the players are going to play hard regardless. So in this game, I want to see them fight. I believe they will fight. Now, we might just not have the horses to get it done. We just might not have enough firepower, enough oomph to score enough to keep up with the Saints because you could have a good game defensively and you could still give up 28-plus because they have so much talent offensively. They're so well-coached offensively that they could put up points in a heartbeat. Even if you're playing good defense, they're going to find the end zone a couple of times. Because when you have the best receiver in football and a top five quarterback and a great offensive mind and a really good electric dual threat running back, it makes it extremely difficult to stop, especially on the road, especially on prime time. So it's going to be a tough game for the Colts defense and a tough game for the Colts overall. But I love the fact that we have something to play for in this game. And if the game was played on paper, we'd have no shot. But the game's not played on paper. You still have to go out there. You still have to play the game. The Atlanta Falcons, who have a horrible defense, went on the road and held the New Orleans Saints to nine points. 
Yes, they know the Saints better than us, but still, they went on the road. The numbers would say it's impossible. The metrics, the analytics, you would say it's not possible for the Falcons to go on the road and hold the Saints to only nine points. But they did. They went on the road yesterday, and they beat the 49ers. So the 5-9 and nine Falcons have wins on the road against the 11-3 and three San Francisco 49ers and the 10-3 and three New Orleans Saints. So if they could do it, why can't we do it? On paper, we get blown out. Do I expect to win this game? No. Am I going to take the Colts to win this game? No. I'm going to go with the New Orleans Saints. I think the Saints win this game by either 9 or 10 points. But I think the Colts have a puncher's chance. And I love the fact that we're still alive mathematically. I love the fact that if we win this game, we're still alive heading in to week 16. And that's what I'll be rooting for. I know some people will be rooting for the draft pick. I will not be one of those people. I will be rooting for a heartbeat heading into week 16. It's going to be an uphill battle. On paper, we get our doors blown off. On paper, this is not supposed to be a competitive game, but the game's not played on paper. So I will be rooting for the Colts, but as far as my pick goes, I'm taking the New Orleans Saints at home tonight on Monday Night Football. Yeah, I think this one's going to get ugly. I think the Saints are going to come out fast, score fast, and the Colts are going to be forced into throwing the ball, and that's never a place where the Colts want to be with who they have at quarterback. I think you're going to see Jacoby turn the ball over in this game. I like the Saints by 21. I don't think it's going to be particularly close. I think it's going to get out of hand. I do think they'll score late to make it look somewhat respectable, but I think this is a blowout. I think this is the first blowout of the year for the Colts. I think they will play hard, but they're just so undermanned, and New Orleans is such a better all-around team than the Colts are right now, just as far as the rosters. I mean, the Colts are beat up, but bottom line is that's who they're going to New Orleans with, the roster that they have, and New Orleans is just better. I mean, they're just better. They're better on offense. They're better on defense. They're just all around better. They're better in the special teams. So I expect this to get ugly. I expect 42-20 to 20 wouldn't surprise me, 40-41-20, to 20, something like that, with the Colts getting like a late touchdown to make it look a little better. But I, I think this is going to be a really, really ugly game for the Colts. And you know what time it is, Jason. It's time for the For the Culture Fan of the Show. Today's fan of the show is Jacob. Jacob's been a Colt fan for 17 years. His favorite player on the current team is Jack Doyle. And then he has parentheses WWJDD. I don't even know what that would stand for. Worldwide Jack something Doyle? No, it stands for what would Jack Doyle do? Oh, is that really? Like what would Jesus do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What would Jack Doyle do? Jack Doyle would probably do the right thing. He would block. He would help his teammate up. He would get back to the huddle. If you don't throw him the ball, he wouldn't complain. If you throw him the ball behind him, like after that third and two play, if you threw it behind him, he probably would say it was his fault. He should have caught the ball. Jack Doyle, definitely one of my favorite players on this team as well. What would Jack Doyle what world? What did I say? Worldwide Jack Doyle? <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. I just saw WWJDD. I was like, what the hell does that mean? Favorite player of all time, Bob the Hitman Sanders. Well, I know what this parenthesis means. The Hitman, one of the hardest hitting players in Colts franchise history. And his favorite moment as a Colts fan, the Marlon Jackson interception back in the AFC Championship game in 2006 as the Colts went to the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl back in Super Bowl 41. And his Twitter at handle at SFGiantEra. S-F-G-I-A-N-T-S-E-R-A. So I guess he's also a San Francisco Giants fan, and that's his Twitter ad handle. So if you want to read some Colts tweets and some San Fran Giants tweets, give Jacob a follow on Twitter. And we'll be back on Tuesday with the For the Culture Game recap, recapping the Monday night game against the Saints. So enjoy the game. Hopefully the Colts keep it close, keep it competitive. And we'll be back on Tuesday right here on the For the Culture Podcast.